Vi ringrazio per avermi qui e per darmi l'opportunità di discutere il ruolo dei volatilità e ambiguità nei mercati finanziari. Uh, adesso uh, proseguirò in inglese. Well, what I said is they told me to talk about volatility and ambiguity, but I'm going to say whatever I feel like. Now, <laughs> anyway, um, you see the title of my talk, and in fact, uh, this is not a pure academic talk. I'm going to talk about, of course, matters which are related to academics, whether it's theory or, empiri <laughs> or empirical evidence, and of course also about practice and, you know, what's going on nowadays. Uh, recently, we have seen uh, the VIX coming down to levels that we say have not been there before, but was almost there in 2006 and back in the 80s too, and there were a lot of articles written in the financial press trying to explain why it is low and what is going on. Well, my talk today uh, is going to be, I'm really going to do kind of a quick summary of uh, volatility measures, and I'm going to talk about my new, not so new, maybe the last five years, my research on uh, ambiguity. In fact, uh, this morning we heard two presentations which were basically fo focusing on information, whether it's information uh, about, let's say, informed trading or insider trading, or it's information which gives indication about systemic risk. Well, uh, what I'm going to talk about is also actually talking about information and what kind of information we can extract from the markets. And when we say the markets, it's mainly from the uh, derivatives markets. Now, let me just very quickly, this is the rundown, if you want, the points I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with many of it, but what I want to do it systematically, uh, go over uh, some points where we can learn about it. Let me just, I'm not very comfortable sitting down and talking, so I will. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let me turn on. I always like to put up this first page of the background to give people an idea how huge these markets are. Basically, I'm talking about the derivatives markets, and you'll see later when I'll talk about, give you some examples about the call it so-called volatility markets, you'll see how huge it is. And of course, we can use it for different things, but one aspect which has been used over and over more again is extracting information from the markets. And of course, VIX has been the, I would say, the number one uh, indicator of markets and what information uh, we can get. So here is a very quick rundown and just, you know, to give you an idea back then, a lot of you may have not been born then, but um, let me tell you that, for example, in 1983, when options started trading and um, Bill Zimba was a youngster. Um, I was trading on the floor of the exchange together with 
Steve Fogluski, and we were trading there by implied volatility. We very quickly found out that trading by implied volatility doesn't do it because it so happened that different options had different implied volatilities. We found out very quickly that. And then, uh, based on a actually initially a paper by my colleague, friend, Danny Galai in 1979, who he reset the stage for what later became the VIX. We got together, and in 86, we wrote this paper, which basically puts out, one, the idea of this information measure, looking f the forward-looking information measure, and a market that you can create based on it. So here is another example of what we learned. When the crash happened in 87, the market has changed completely, and it has changed so much that up until today, we have what is called the skew today, which was not a skew before 1987, and so many papers and work and articles have been written about it, and of course, it affected the trading that Bill Zimba is also involved in. And then, right then, there was already a demand for volatility uh, derivatives. So after the VIX was launched and the methodology was changed, then we found out that there is a market over the counter for what is called variance swaps. And right after, we have the market on futures, <coughs> options, and ETFs. By the way, as I'll show you soon, the market on futures, the futures on VIX didn't take off for at least two years, even more than that, until options came about. And the main reason was that whoever was making a market or was willing to make a market in futures couldn't do it because, or didn't want to do it because there was no vehicle that they could hedge with, the underlying was not trading. So what do we find out? The options are introduced, and slowly, after, in, in the following years, we have a market coming to the point where it became actually one of the biggest markets trading uh, in derivatives, and especially in futures and options. Europe came about later with V stocks in 2009, options uh, on V stocks, and recently, the Shanghai Stock Exchange introduced, a, finally, an implied volatility index. There's still no derivatives on that index, but it does give you information what the market thinks about volatility in the next 30 days, like with VIX. Here is an indication. Look, I just pulled this out recently. And you see that one example, futures on VIX. Look how it took off with an average daily volume of almost 240,000. And one of the main reasons was the introduction of options. Though the introduction of options was Right here in 2006, the, because of the financial crisis and so on, the market didn't take off just until the financial crisis was settled down. And then, because you had these two markets, it took off. Now look, for example, at futures and options on V stocks. Again, here, it's an example of the open interest, which is huge. It's about, right now, about 600,000 uh, <coughs> futures contracts and over a million uh, options contracts. Now, let me talk a little bit about the methodology. 
And the reason I'm just mentioning the old methodology is not because it so happened that Annie and I were involved in it. It's because there is, there are exchanges that are reconsidering the methodology that the CBOE is using. And therefore, it is worthwhile to, to look at it. And as I'll show you on the in couple of pages, what we do, pay attention to the last line here. There's a study by Carr and Vu that people, not many people are aware of. It turned out that the difference is very little. The correlation between these two methodologies comes out to be around 98%. So it doesn't matter so much because the focus is on or most of the information you get or what gets into the calculation of VIX is the around the money options. Now here is the methodology which is very much the same as was used by the CBOE before and is used by a couple of exchanges nowadays and that is that all you do is you combine options which are at the money and you combine two maturities to always give you a 30-day measure. Okay, So if you notice in this way, because of the biases that people have with black shoals, and that's why they came up with the other methodology, among other things, we don't use the implied up until the very end. We use the actual option prices, and only at the very end, when we get what is called the synthetic call price, we convert it to an implied volatility as Many of you probably know when you do it, since this is basically money, then there is almost a linear relationship between the call price and uh, volatility. So the conversion is simple, and it doesn't matter so much which model price is it. This is the new method, so-called new methodology, the one that CBOE uses, uh, V-Stocks use, the Shanghai Stock Exchange uses, and so on, where you use all the options, basically what they say, out of the money, but everything you move away from at the money is called out of the money or away from the money, and it's weighted by the strike square to give you a measure which is more, let's say, model-free and uh, kind of as if theoretically it's a more correct measure. Uh, let me go very quickly through this, and this is uh, related to some stuff that I said in the morning. Um, and I don't know if I'll have a disagreement, yes or no, with Bill later about it. But basically what you see is every time you see, let's say, a very big spike in VIX, it is concurrently, simultaneously coming with the decline in the market. And I don't think you can use VIX to be a predictor like many people believe, like many analysts believe you can use as a predictor of where the market is going. In fact, if anything, I think it's the other way around. As soon as the market declines, VIX jumps basically uh, simultaneously. But let me uh, do two more things. One, we talked about, and in the morning, Cristiano talked about all these, <coughs> the VLAB and so on at NYU. So I felt that we always need to, I like to compare the VIX to the methodology used by Rob Engel on all what he does, and that's the Gartz methodology. And as you can see, almost consistently, the Gartz, you have Gartz in the red, 
and you have VIX in the blue. And it's on the average about, uh, let's say, almost 2% percent percentage points um, is it's higher. And of course, people will are doing work. This is called the volatility risk premium. And people are writing papers, research, what can explain that uh, difference. But it's pretty much alike. If you look at it, they really move together. Now, here is another thing which I just did at the end of April. Um, and I did a comparison of these measures, these information measures, VIX, the European one, and the Chinese one. And by the way, the Chinese one is the one that the CBOE is computing on options not traded in China. Because options in China have started just trading in 2015. And what you get here is, we talked about globalization this morning. To some extent, you see the globalization. When one is up, all the three of them are up, but not always. You know, sometimes, you know, one is up and the others are not, and so on. And of course, if you look, for example, at the point, and I'll point out where uh, Brexit is. If, oh, the pointer works. Let me see if the pointer works. OK, it doesn't matter. If you look at the blue line, which is V stocks here, then it jumped much higher. <coughs> this is where Brexit was. Or, for example, the greens, which are China, this is around when the Chinese market in 2015 started declining. You see a much higher volatility. So that's one thing you would notice. The other thing you should notice is over the years, what happened was if years back, when volatility had a big jump, I essentially mean VIX, it took a while for it to come down. I mean, it came down, it reached a peak like in 2008 and even back in 87, but then it started climbing down. Recently, or more recently, we started seeing the reverse very quick. In other words, it can jump, and then in a short while, it goes back down. And the, the biggest example, the most example is, of course, was the night of Trump's elections, where the VIX jumped within the night and so on, whatever was measured, and then it turned around very quickly. Same was happened in Brexit and so on. Things turned around very quickly. So that is a change the way uh, the measures go. I just, for the kicks, we always used in the equities markets to talk about this negative relationship. So the market goes down, volatility of your own VIX goes up. It's not necessarily so in other markets. And that's why I'm giving you this example, because in the oil market, for example, where you see the red is the oil, the VIX of oil went up very much when the price of oil, if you recall, went through the roof to $140 a barrel. And that's when VIX went also up. So you would say, well, in the oil market, it's the other way around. No, when the oil market here recently declined sharply to about $30 a barrel, VIX jumped too. So you, cannot, you have to look at every market separately, and you cannot draw the same kind of conclusions. There's no doubt that what is kind of consistent is in the equities market, there is a negative correlation between where the market goes, if you want the return, and the change in volatility. And I'll show regressions because that has somewhat changed also. 
Now, just to complete that, talking about all the markets, this is the currency market. I chose just the dollar-euro market. You can see that the standard, by the way, in the currency market, because the potential of government interventions and so on, volatility on the average is in the order of magnitude of maybe 10%, even lower, except when something like 2008 happens. That's where you get numbers like 25 to 30%, and then it starts going down, and this is what we see recently happening. Now, as an academic, I have to talk about what kind of research do we have, and I put it in three groups, basically. One, using the index, almost everyone that does like, <laughs> in the, not in the old days, but when you do research on asset pricing, they always tell you, what about all these factors, French and pharma French, and so on. Nowadays, it's been for years, oh, did you introduce VIX into related, unrelated, whatever. Put in VIX as a factor. So you find in many pieces of research, VIX appearing as a factor. Then, uh, of course, a statistical analysis of the relationship between realized, that's what I mentioned before, the volatility risk premium is being done. And now that we have, for years now, the market on VIX derivatives, options, futures, and so on, there is research on it. I'm, I was surprised there is not enough research on it. There is some research on it, but there should be much more research on it. Probably we will see it uh, in the coming years. Now, here is what I told you. This is a regression I run every couple of months. Just two regressions. One is RV is the realized variance. Can the realized variance be explained by historical volatility? In some sense, you could replace it by a gorge. And VIX. And it turns out, and this is pretty consistent, the explanatory power is pretty high. And historical volatility does play a non-trivial role in explaining the upcoming realized volatility. Okay. Now, the other one is the classic, which I talked about, negative correlation between the change in VIX and the change in the market. And guys, if you run, the, I ran this regression years back. What is written here, R square 34%, used to be between 70 and 80%. Almost every move in the market, up, VIX goes down. Down, VIX goes up. The market has somehow internalized it. And over the years, small moves don't do much. Sometimes you see the market moving up, VIX moving up, and vice versa. It's still big moves. You do have this negative relationship. Now, here are, this is kind of an, yes. This is kind of an introduction, if you want, to derivatives on volatility. So, of course, volatility is stochastic, and it can cause disastrous losses. And I just used two examples. Go back to the story of bearings. You see that? When it was, when people traded these options, or when he traded options, and, of course, chapter two or four, I think, in the book on long-term capital, which focuses on the volatility position that this hedge fund long-term capital management is. They were basically short volatility, and they didn't hedge any part of it. And if they would have hedged part of it, they, they still would have gone bankrupt because of their bigger trade. But volatility was one of their trade trading volatility. Of course, a dynamic strategy was plain vanilla options described by, in a paper by Karin Madan, uh, could do some of the trick, but 
practically it would be too costly. So you really needed like derivatives on a volatility index. Now, here are some observations before I'll discuss uh, further the pricing of these. Options on VIX are the three most active options. Uh, the call volume, of course, is naturally bigger than the put volume. Um, futures and options and VIX have huge, I already mentioned that. And here is a puzzle, which I have one explanation, other explanations. Though these markets are very active, have huge volumes, the bid and ask spread is still very wide, even today. And I think that one of the reasons, and I'm talking about the options, not the futures. The futures have a very narrow bid-ask spread. And I think the reason is because there is huge disagreement about the pricing of these options. Now, as you know, you know there is now VIX, or the options and futures are on the index, not on the futures. However, um, I'll go down to talk about ETFs. ETFs trade on NASDAQ, large volume. Futures and options on V-stocks now have larger volume. We still don't have futures and options on the Chinese index. It'll take a long time, I guess, because the regulators in China have a problem with derivatives, as you may know, when the market declined in 2015, they banned, essentially banned trading in uh, the futures on the index. Now, let me talk about the pricing. The main issue is the pricing by no arbitrage. Underlying is not traded. Options are European cash settled. The future have any kind of cost of carry model, and with the option, the same thing. However, if you look at the market, you'll find out that they're basically trading off the spot which they are settled on, but off the futures on the spot. And at the end of the day, as we know, on expiration, the futures become the spot and therefore, it's not a bad idea to trade them. So, for example, put call parity does hold. Here is a new development that just happened the last couple of weeks, is options, the Europeans are introducing an option directly on the futures contract on V-stocks, and they're making it an American option. Okay, uh, I don't know how much time I've left. Five minutes, you said. Let me talk briefly. This is my research in the past, I would say, five years. So I'll do it very simply. One of the things that came up, especially recently, when VIX was so low, below 10%, and people start wondering, they say, well, and you, you could see articles in the papers saying, VIX is so low, but the market is so anxious. The market, you talk to people and they say, how come it's 10%? We feel that it, what do you mean you feel? I mean, we think it should be much higher and so on. And I'm doing this research on ambiguity. It's still, I would say, in, in what? in progress, so to speak, to see whether ambiguity gives us additional information over VIX, so, or over any kind of volatility measure. So we know what risk is. Risk is what people call the known unknowns. You have given probabilities. What is unknown are the outcomes. Ambiguity, in simple words, what's called night's uncertainty or unknown, the unknown unknowns, 
It's basically the uncertainty of the probabilities themselves, as if you will build a distribution over every probability. And the way we measure it is by, in very simple words, by the volatility of the probabilities. Of course, we're making some assumptions, some may say strong assumptions, but you have to do it if you want to get somewhere. By the way, the basic research, the theory behind it, is done by my colleague, Yehuda Yitzhakian, who is a mathematician, is a professor at Baruch College, and many times he has to explain to me what he's doing. So I'm trying, I'm getting the gist of it, and we have written a paper where we are trying to basically deal with an issue that we had over the years. You could say a big challenge where simply all these tests we have done over the years about the relationship between risk and return, we get all kinds of results. We get negative results, we get no results, and in our paper, we introduce the measure of ambiguity in addition to the measure of risk, and we get the risk-return relationship to come out the way we always thought it should be, which is a positive relationship, one between risk and return, and two very significant. Um, well, it's up to, of course, challenges and so on, but at least it's an advanced stage at the JFE, so somebody maybe thought there is something to it. Um, let me just show you one chart about it and say two things which came up as questions. One, what is the correlation between VIX and our measure of ambiguity? Two, isn't the measure of ambiguity really volatility of volatility? The answer is, to both of them, there is very low correlation. One, between VIX and our measure. Two, between VIX and a measure of volatility, volatility of volatility. And just to show you an example here, so of course, if you look at the spike here, which is the highest value we got for ambiguity, it coincides, of course, with the high 80% VIX during the 2008. But if you go along the line at several points, you'll find out that VIX could be high, our ambiguity measure is low, and vice versa. Look here at recent times where VIX here essentially is very low, but at some point, relatively, our ambiguity measure comes out to be rather high. Um, and let me maybe finish with one. I'm looking at all different kind of, as I started saying, information. What do we get information about the markets? And you probably heard about what's called implied correlation in, and I chose the currency market because the currency market is one market where I can measure precisely the implied correlation because what's called the triangular relationship between the currencies, the main currencies. There's always a triangular relationship. There's no arbitrage in this market. You can turn this around and compute exactly an implied correlation. And what I was kind of curious about is this. I took Brexit and I said, let me see what does implied correlation, where in my mind it says if there is, they're going to stay in the union, then the correlation between the British pound and the euro, the non both denominated in dollars, should stay relatively high. If there is going to be a Brexit, then it should become lower. So if, you know, I'm not 
<coughs> explaining what happened before, but if you look at the Brexit, just before the vote, the number was high, which means at least this market too said there's not going to be a Brexit. And then as soon as the vote came out, it sharply declined. But then after a while, I said, well, maybe that's not such much an effect, and it's in the range. So I thought maybe this is a, another additional piece of information that we can use sometimes. And I haven't tested it yet on other uh, events like that. So he says, stop. So I will almost stop. <laughs> and I just summarize what, yeah what I talked about. I mainly talked about VIX because it has become such a powerful tool that is being used all over. And I've just been in Israel, and a friend of mine who is a physician, who is a doctor, said to me, you know, why is VIX so low? He's a gynecologist. <laughs> I said, what do you know about VIX? He says, well, I read about it. It's very interesting and so on. It's just to show you that it, be it became such a measure that it's like people talk about the Dow Jones and uh, maybe the S&P, they talk about VIX. And I look at it, of course, as an information tool. But this kind of information tool is different than all the ones that we look about backwards it's a tool of looking forward, and there are other tools, but it'll basically always be based. If you want to truly talk about forward looking, it has to be based on the derivatives market. So there are other measures. Credit Suisse has another interesting measure. You can look it up. But anyway, if you want to talk to me more about the Credit Suisse measure, <laughs> I'll be glad to talk to you after the, uh, the break. Thank you very much. Thank you.